The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. Uh, about a year ago, I put an app on my uh, phone and on my iPad uh, called My Fitness Pal. It's an incredible app, an amazing app. You can put your, your weight on there and your goal, that's what you want your weight to be, and it figures out how many calories you should be taking in each day, and it gives you this suggested exercise plan uh, that's available for you. It tells you how much water you should drink. It has this listing of the calorie content of all the foods you can eat. If you don't know for sure, you can even scan it, and it will it'll actually research it for you and will give you the calorie count uh, for the things that, that you might be eating. Even restaurant foods, you can put in restaurant foods. It'll tell you what the calorie count is for all those those restaurant foods. It, it will chart your progress as you move forward on it. It, uh, it will send you messages of encouragement. Hey, I haven't seen you for a while, or how you doing, or great job, you know. If you're connecting with others on Facebook who are using the same program, they can see how you're doing to give you accountability. You can actually even get messages from them of encouragement and support as you go through it. In fact, I've got it on my phone. I've got it on my iPad. It's an incredible app, an incredible app. In fact, really, everything that I need to know about getting fit and losing weight is right there. (laughs) But if you don't use it, if you don't do something with it, it's pretty worthless. And, And you can have all the best intentions of the world. You can have a really good heart and have great information, the best information, but it's useless unless you're willing to put it into practice. It's it's all for nothing unless you're willing to put it into practice. And this is where James brings us today in our study of radical faith. You see, James calls us to have radical faith. He calls us to have faith that's beyond the normal, to to live above the rim in our faith, to, to be over the top, that kind of faith that he wants us to have, a radical faith. And James taught us that a radical faith that joyfully sees trials and tests as a way to grow stronger in our faith through radical endurance. He taught us two weeks ago that it's radical endurance that helps us see joyfully the trials and tests as a way of growing stronger through that faith. And last week we talked about the fact that radical faith understands how Satan tempts us so that we can live as victors over rather than victims of sin through radical resistance. And now James wants us to see that a radical faith matches authentic faith words with authentic faith actions through radical behavior, through radical behavior. And that's God's plan for us in our lives. How many of you brought your Bibles with you tonight? How many brought them? Okay. Uh, you got your Bibles uh, or your uh, uh, PDAs that have those Bibles on there. I encourage you to bring those. We're going to have the verses for you, but I encourage you to use them. And how many of you read through the book of James this week? Raise your hand if you read. All right. Great job. Keep it up. Keep it up as you grow in what God desires. Well, today we're looking at a really long section of the book of James. And instead of going through it verse by verse, I'm going to go to the last couple of verses and then work our way backwards as we look at our text. And so in James chapter 2, uh, verses 24 and verse 26, James says this. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. As a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, if you just read those verses alone you could be led to a misunderstanding about your faith walk with God. It sounds like James is saying to us that faith plus works equals salvation. Faith plus works equals salvation. That we're not saved just by trusting Christ as Savior and Lord. We're not saved just by trusting Christ and getting on base with God, where you you believe that Jesus is the only Savior and the only Lord. There you go. Faith plus works equals salvation. It sounds like James is saying that that it's not just by uh, having and trusting Christ. It's not by just uh, on base admitting you're a sinner and, and then surrendering by repenting of that sin and then expressing that faith in Christian baptism. It sounds like James says we're not just saved by trusting Christ as Savior and Lord, but we also have to add to it lots of good works. And we have to earn and keep our salvation by doing good works. But listen, this isn't what James is teaching, and this isn't what I'm teaching you either. Remember that James was written to Christians. 
He's not trying to convert non-believers into becoming Christians. He's challenging Christ followers to step up to the plate in their faith walk. He's challenging believers to, to match their faith with their actions. Because apparently this was a problem in these believers' lives. that They were professing Christ, but their actions were not displaying Christ. Now, I don't have that problem in my life. I, you know, in my life, when God asks me to do something, I do it without question. 100% of the time, I always match my faith and my actions. They're, they're absolutely perfect. I never do anything outside of what God wants. Any of you have that problem? Yeah, we all do, don't we? Every one of us struggle with this issue. And, and that's what James wants us to understand because we all deal with it. In fact, um, what James is trying to help us understand here is this, this very simple principle. See, there are some who believe uh, that your salvation and teach that your salvation is based on works. That it's what you do. If you follow all the rules and you do all the practices, that then you're going to be saved. Then your salvation. And there are many churches, there are many plans that actually teach that. And down through the years, that extreme has been taught that you have to earn your salvation. But you see, that's out of balance. That's not God's plan. And so there are some Christians and some churches that are teaching that your salvation is on the basis of faith alone. That all you have to do is believe. Just believe. And once you believe, and when you believe, then you're saved. That's all you have to do. And that there's no accountability for the way you live your life. In fact, they teach that once you, you get saved, once you accept Christ as Savior, then it doesn't make any difference once you do. Once you're saved, your, your uh, personal responsibility is removed. And that's out of balance too because that's not what God desires. So James is wanting us to understand this principle that, that the reality is that it's faith that works that makes all the difference in the world. This is what God desires from us. This is God's plan for us, that it's faith plus works that makes all the difference. Now, in some New Testament books, like the book of Galatians, Paul is writing to a group of believers who got out of whack, and they were teaching that it's all about works. It's all about what you do that provides for your salvation. And they've gotten it out of balance. So Paul swims the pendulum the other direction to faith and says, it's all about your faith. It's trusting Christ. You can't do anything during your salvation. But in the book of James, he's got a group of Christians who are believing that works are the basis of our faith. And so he, he wants to point out the importance of faith, that we have to make sure that we're living by faith and trusting God by faith in our behaviors. And James comes along to combine those two, to keep the pendulum in its proper perspective and teach us that it's faith that works that matters to God. God wants us to understand that, and it's so principled. It's not works plus faith that equals salvation. That's a kind of legalism. That says you do the right things and you'll be saved. And it's not works, uh, it's not faith not works that brings salvation. That's easy believism. That's just simply saying you just believe and you're saved, and whatever you do after that really doesn't matter. And that's not what God teaches either. So James teaches the believers that in this latter group, that we need to understand what it's faith that works that makes all the difference in the world. You see, some of those believers were believing that once you became a Christian, how you lived your life doesn't matter. They were saying, well, as long as we say we're believers, that's enough. Since, since I have faith in God, nothing more I can do to earn my salvation, what I do, then the way I live my life really doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want to because it doesn't count for anything if I'm saved solely by our faith. And herein lies the critical problem for our witness in the world. One of the primary reasons why Christianity is exploding and flourishing in Africa and in South America and in Asia is because they understand this principle. And one of the reasons why our Christian faith is dying in Europe and the United States is because we don't practice what we preach. We just don't practice what we preach. We say one thing and we do something else. According to George Barna and Barna Research, that in the people in the United States have a very high regard for Jesus. They respect Jesus greatly. But they have a very low regard for the church. And why is that? Well, because they hear about Jesus. And they hear how Jesus loved and cared and touched people and, and, and uh, ministered to people and took care of the sick and, and the poor. And, and, and they don't see the churches doing that same thing in the world in which we live. They don't see it fleshed out. And because of that, there's no authenticity to the faith. 
In fact, according to George Barna in 2008, 72% of the U.S. population surveyed said that the church is full of hypocrites. Well, that's true. They could say 100% because the church is full of hypocrites. None of us do everything. But the problem is when the church, when the people in the world look at the church and they don't see us being like Jesus, then indeed we are hypocrites. So my friends, this is a message that we need to hear. It's your faith coming out of your fingertips that counts with God. It's talking the talk and walking the walk that matters to God. It's faith that works, that honors God, and will change the world. Now, there are a couple of verses that Paul gives us in Ephesians that really, I think, show this proper balance. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul says this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. And it's not by works so that anyone can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Some time ago, you know I like to cook, and some time ago I, I, in a bookstore, used bookstore, I saw a book that's called The Three Ingredient Cookbook. The Three Ingredient Cookbook. And that intrigued me. And, uh, and so I was flipping through there to see, and, and it had a whole list of things that you can make, meals that you can make, appetizers, regular food, with just three ingredients. And one of those was called the three-ingredient peanut butter cookie. The three-ingredient peanut butter cookie. And it says you need these three ingredients. You need peanut butter, you need sugar, and you need eggs. Peanut butter, sugar, and eggs. And you can make a mean cookie with those. But what happens if you take one of those three ingredients out? And what happens if you combine sugar and eggs together? Well, you're going to get something that's sweet, but it's not going to be a peanut butter cookie. And let's say that you combine peanut butter and eggs. What are you going to get? Well, you're going to get a peanut butter pancake, but you're not going to get a peanut butter cookie. So it takes all three ingredients to make a good peanut butter cookie. And that's exactly what Paul is teaching us here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He's teaching us as he writes of our salvation that we are saved by grace. God's marvelous grace that he poured into our lives, that he gave us freely because and through Jesus Christ. But we're saved by grace through faith. We have to receive the gift. We have to accept that gift through faith. And we're saved by grace through faith for good works. That we might demonstrate that to the world. This is God's plan. All three ingredients are absolutely critical. See, James teaches us, as does Paul here, that God offers his salvation by grace. You can do nothing to earn God's grace. He he looks at you and loves you in spite of who you are and what you do. But he says, then we have to accept his salvation by faith. We have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. His grace is wonderful, but if we don't accept it, there is no salvation. And so we are saved. God offers his salvation by grace. We accept his salvation by faith, and we display his salvation by our good works. This is authentic faith. This is the authentic faith that the world is looking for. This is the authentic faith that the world is looking for and will beat a path to our door for if we will display it and demonstrate it. And we must show this kind of faith in our community. But herein is the problem. A few years ago, McDonald's um, asked its customers what they wanted most from McDonald's restaurant. And the people responded dramatically that what they wanted was a healthier menu at McDonald's. In fact, the number one request was for a healthy cheeseburger, which I don't know how that's possible, but that's what they wanted, a healthy cheeseburger. So McDonald's put their researchers to work for it, and they came up with a burger, kind of, that was called the McLean Sandwich. How many of you remember the McLean Sandwich? Just a couple of you? That's probably because it didn't even last two years on their menu. Because what they discovered is, oh, everybody wanted a healthy menu. Nobody ordered it. Nobody really wanted it bad enough to order it. They said they wanted it, but they didn't order from the restaurant. In fact, most preachers will tell you that people demand a healthy menu at the places where they go to eat. They just don't order from it. They say one thing, and they do something else. You want me to give you an example of what I'm talking about? The number one food item in state fairs across the United States last year was the Krispy Kreme bacon cheeseburger. (laughs) 
Yeah. It's going to make your mouth water, doesn't it? (laughs) See, we say something, but we don't follow through on it. And that's what James is talking about. Now, these messages on a radical faith are are not for the faint of heart. These aren't just feel-good messages. Understand that. In chapter 2, verse 14, James says this, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? And there's a phrase in that that just plagues me. What good is it? I mean, what good is it if we profess Christ in the baptistry and continue to have sex outside of marriage? What good is it if if we say that we're saved and accepting Christ as Savior and Lord and yet willfully continue in known sin or don't give it all for our families to minister and love them? What good is it if we sing praises in worship and then cuss like a sailor at work or or tell dirty jokes or, or gossip about someone behind their back? What good is it? What good is it if we proudly give to the dollar club, but we don't tithe, give 10% as God wants us to give to the body of Christ? Or if we don't help a neighbor who's in need? Or if we don't buy lunch for a coworker who's in need of support and prayer and care? What good is it? What good is it if we come to church every Sunday, but we don't even walk across the street to invite our neighbor to come or to share Christ with a friend or a coworker? What good is it? What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? James says in verses 15 through 17, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about it and those physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is what? Dead. He goes on in verses 20 and 22. He says, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. By what he did. Now, don't misread me. I'm not saying that we are saved by what we do. I'm saying that we are saved by God's marvelous grace who looked at us in our sin and loved us anyway. And he offered his son Jesus to sacrifice on Calvary's cross to pay the price for all of our sins. And he said, if anyone who believes in me, he may come. And so God gave us salvation by his grace, and we accept it through faith, and it's for good works. But James, in our study, gives us a list of ways then for us to demonstrate that faith through our good works. One of the ways we are to show our faith, James says, is through anger management. In James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, he says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. You can say, I'm a Christian, but if you lose your temper all the time, it's not faith that works. James says that we can display our faith by living by the word. In James chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I mean, you you can say, I've got faith in Jesus, but if you're not doing what he says, that's not faith that works. James says that we can demonstrate our faith by taming our tongue. In James 1, 26, he says, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is, what? Worthless. Worthless. That's not faith. You can say, oh, I'm a Christ follower. I'm saved by grace. Praise God. But that's not faith that works. James tells us that we can show our faith by helping the hurting. By helping the hurting. In James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless 
is this. Look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep oneself being polluted by the world. Seeing the needs of others. And you can say, well, I'm a, I'm a Christ follower. Praise God. But if you see needs and you're not trying to reach those needs, that's not faith that works. James says we can show our faith by loving everyone equally. In James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. I mean, you can claim to be a follower of Christ, but, but if you say to someone, I like them better than this person or this person better than that person, and you show favor to them on the basis of their economic standards or their family standards or their race or their color or whatever it might be, you show favoritism, that's not faith that works. And James says in James chapter 2, verse 12, that it's faith that works that matters to God. James says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Now notice, he doesn't say that we are judged by the law that gives freedom. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for all our sins on Calvary's cross. We're saved by grace through faith, but for good works. So just because we're saved by grace through faith, it doesn't mean that we don't have to recognize that God expects us to live radical in our behavior. We should live as if we're being judged by the law, even though we're not. And friends, this, this is what our world and this is what our community is waiting for. Christ followers who don't just claim they want to be like Jesus, but who empty themselves of themselves who consistently look for ways to be Jesus, who represent Jesus so strongly, so passionately, so authentically, and not because they want to manipulate anyone, but because they just love Jesus that much. That's what God wants of us. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you a message called Vision 1213. And in that message, I introduced to you a term called incarnational. And let me give you a def definition. A definition of incarnation is reflecting Jesus. You simply reflect Jesus in the way you live in your neighborhood, the way you care for your neighbors, the way you help your neighbors. You live and reflect Jesus in the way you work, how you treat people at work and how you do your job. And, and you're, you simply reflect Jesus the way you, you act at school, not cheating and and living a moral lifestyle, encouraging those to do it, being compassionate for others. You reflect Jesus by the way you care for your family. You love your mother and father. You love your kids. Or you pray for each other. You support each other. And you care for each other. You simply reflect Jesus in the way you pay your bills. You, you reflect Jesus on the way you drive your car. You reflect Jesus in the way you treat people. Just imagine with me for a moment that if all 2,700 plus people who came and come to Chandler Christian Church, if we were incarnational in our community, that we just reflected Jesus continually in the way we loved like Jesus and served like Jesus and listened like Jesus and behaved like Jesus and cared like Jesus and touched like Jesus and gave like Jesus. And that when people looked at us, they didn't see us at all. They just saw Jesus. That would be radical. And that's what God asks of every one of us. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you at the end of the message where we were talking about radical endurance and the aspect of standing faithfully when you go through tests and trials, I shared with you the story of our son Jeremy and how he maintained his faith in difficult times, stayed faithful even to the point of death. And after the service, in one of the services, um, I, I ran into a young man out in the, the lobby. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I, he said, I, I'm not even sure. He said, I'm not even really sure what I believe or if I believe anything. I'm kind of seeking, and, and I've been coming here for a couple of weeks. 
But he said that story you told about your son who endured so much for so long and yet kept the faith. How do you argue with that kind of authentic faith? And the answer is, you can't. We can teach it. We can put messages on the sign. But what this world is definitely looking for are people who are so sold out for Jesus that the way they display him is radical in their behavior. And that they are incarnational, that they reflect Jesus so much and so strongly no matter what they face. That he is lifted up. That's God's passion. James says in James chapter 1, Verses 23 through 25. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is, is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, faith that works. He will be blessed in what he does. So my challenge to you today is that you'll check yourselves out in God's mirror every day. When you walk into the workplace, when you get up in the morning, when you go out on the street, when you're in the store, when you're at the school, when you're involved in your friendship circles, that you'll look at your face in God's mirror and make sure that you're reflecting Jesus in radical behavior. A number of years ago now, my brother-in-law was ministering in a church in Ohio. And on one particular Sunday morning, a woman... Uh, came, a single mom, uh, came to that church service and noted on her card that she would like to talk to someone about accepting Christ as Savior. And so uh, my brother-in-law, Ron, and uh, one of his uh, men that he had trained, one of the leaders of the church, uh, uh, met, uh, met an appointment, called her up and said, could you come to the office? We'll talk to you. And she said, well, I've got two young children, and it's, I have to take a bus to come to church, so it'd be, if, is it possible that you could come and meet with me at my home? And so they said, yes, they could make that appointment. And so uh, my brother-in-law and his friend uh, got on their car and found the apartment where she lived. And it was not in a very nice area of town, just a small apartment. When they went in the apartment, um, they could tell it was just a one-bedroom apartment and, and that she didn't have a lot of stuff in the apartment. Uh, a young single mother, she had two little kids, and the kids were just kind of everywhere, swinging off of everything, and so excited to have people in the house, you know. And... Um, so he said they sat down and opened their Bibles and they were trying to help her understand how she could get on base with God, how she could believe and admit their sin and, and surrender her heart to Christ and be, express that faith in Christian baptism. And, and the kids were just everywhere, you know. And my brother-in-law said he could tell very quickly that, that it was just going to be impossible for them to have a serious discussion with the mother as long as the two little kids were in there. So my brother-in-law said, hey, kids, how about we go into the kitchen and find maybe something for you to eat? Now, you got to understand, my brother-in-law, that is so outside of his realm of comfort that I'm amazed that I could even tell this story. But that's what happened. And so the kid said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said to the mother, said, okay. And she said, sure. And so he took the two little kids into the kitchen, closed the door behind so his friend could share the faith and the scriptures with this woman. He said that they kept pointing to the refrigerator. So he opened the refrigerator up and there wasn't much in there. But he said they kept pointing to this plastic cup that had something inside that looked like a melted candy bar. And they said, we want that, we want that, we want that. So he pulled it out and got a, a fork and a, and a spoon and a knife and put one kid on one leg and one kid on the other and began chiseling on this stuff to get it out. Every little piece he got, they'd dig their hands in and eat it. And, and uh, he, he, he stretched it as long as he could and he peeked back through the door and they were still studying the scriptures. So he said, well, kids, would you show me your bedroom? And they said, we only have one, we all sleep together. And he said, well, could we go in there? And they said, yeah, yeah, we'll show you our room. And so they kind of made their way quietly through the living room and went into the bedroom. And the kids were showing all the toys they had and opened up the bureau drawers and showing them their underwear and their mom's underwear and, you know, all this stuff. 
Ron said, after a few minutes, there was a knock at the door. The mother was there, and she said, we're finished now. You can come back out. And so they uh, met together with her, and, and uh, she said, I, I want Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Next Sunday uh, at church, I want to be baptized into Christ. So that following Sunday, they uh, went to church, and service was offered, and offer the invitation to accept Christ as Savior, and this woman responded positively, and after the service, she was baptized into Christ. And as they were leaving that day, my brother-in-law came around through their foyer, their lobby, and, and he saw this young mother with a, a couple of friends and the man who had talked to her, and he, and he saw the two little kids, and so he, he came up behind the kids, and he said, hey, kids, remember me? What's my name? And one turned around and looked at him and said, you're Jesus. Now, Ron said, I'm the farthest thing from Jesus. But he wasn't at that moment. These little kids who didn't know much about the Bible, didn't know much about God, they simply saw someone loving them and caring for them. And the only one that they knew could do that was Jesus. Reflecting Jesus. Faith that works radical faith that means radical behavior authentic intentional incarnational behavior that reflects Jesus and if you want to change your world if you want to change your community if you want to change your neighborhood if you change want to change your family. You can preach all you want, and that's important. But what James says that really matters is faith that works. Radical behavior. But that's your decision. What will you decide? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for your truths that teach us how to radically be what you want us to be. That teach us how to step apart and to step away and step a bit higher. That teach us how we can live above the rim and beyond that which is normal and, and step into that which is radical for your son Jesus. And I pray, God, that today we would make the decision to take that step. Maybe... Maybe if tonight it's a decision to surrender our hearts for the very first time, that we would say, this is it. It's faith that works. That's what I want. Maybe tonight for many of us in this room, it's just the simple realization that we were saved to do those good works that display Jesus Christ, reflect Jesus Christ in an incarnational way that will transform our lives and transform our families and transform our friendships and transform those mission circles that we can make a difference in this world. Help us to choose today to make the decisions that you want us to make. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.